Hello and welcome back. This is the next video lecture in ICJ's course on litigation before you and treaty bodies. We have so far examined the treaty bodies, the concept of strategic litigation and different stages in litigating a case before the treaty bodies as well as the structure of a complaint. In this video, we'll zoom into a particular stage of the process, the admissibility of the complaint. Each complaint submitted to the treaty bodies needs to satisfy the relevant admissibility criteria of the respective treaty and treaty body. These are largely the same for each treaty body with some variations which can be found either in the relevant treaty or the treaty body's rules of procedure. Only where a case is found admissible will the treaty body proceed to consider whether a violation has actually occurred. Broadly speaking, for a complaint to be admissible before the Human Rights Committee, it must meet the criteria set out in Articles 1 and 5 of the Optional Protocol to the ICCPR and Rule 99 of the Committee's Rules of Procedure from 2021. These include that, first, complaints must not be submitted anonymously, as already discussed in video number 3. In addition, the alleged violations must fall within the jurisdiction of the relevant committee. To show that the Human Rights Committee has jurisdiction, the alleged violations must have been committed after the State Party ratifi ratified the optional protocol to the Covenant or must have been ongoing at the time the optional protocol entered into force. So it is not the moment of ratification of or accession to the treaty that counts, but rather the moment the State Party ratified the optional protocol or made the declaration recognizing the relevant committee's competence to accept individual complaints. If we take the example of Libya, we see that it acceded to the optional protocol on 16th May 1989. The optional protocol enters into force three months after accession, so in Libya's case, the optional protocol entered into force on 16th August 1989. An enforced disappearance that was committed in Libya in 1988, but was still ongoing at the time of submission of a complaint after 16th August 1989, would fall within the committee's jurisdiction. The unlawful use of force in stopping protest in 1987 would not fall within the committee's jurisdiction. The complaint must also allege a violation of a right enshrined in the Covenant. Alleged violation of rights not enshrined in the Covenant will not be admissible. It therefore always helps to clearly identify the article of the Covenant you allege to have been violated. This will ensure that you do not allege a violation of a right that does not exist in the Covenant, such as the right to property. The alleged violations also need to be substantiated, meaning that you have to provide a certain amount of information in regard to the alleged violation for the committee to consider. An allegation in and of itself is not sufficient. It needs to be backed up with evidence. This is therefore not only important for the consideration of the merits of the case, but also its admissibility. The Human Rights Committee will declare inadmissible any complaint that is being examined by another procedure under international investigation or settlement. The Committee will therefore not consider a complaint that is at the same time being considered by, for example, another committee, such as the Committee Against Torture or the African Commission on Human and People's Rights. The rules of procedure of the Human Rights Committee specify that the Committee may, however, take up a complaint after it has been considered by such a body. The Human Rights Committee's approach to this is somewhat unique, as other treaty bodies, such as, for example, the Committee Against Torture and the African Commission, will not consider any complaint that is or has already been considered by another treaty body or other regional procedure. This requirement does not apply to complaints submitted to UN Special Procedures of the Human Rights Council, such as Special Rapporteurs, which we briefly discussed in video number one, as these are not considered to constitute relevant international procedures for the purpose of complaints before the committees. So a complaint submitted to a special procedure does not prevent consideration of the same complaint by a treaty body. The situation is slightly different when it comes to the UN Working Group on Arbitrary Detention. As we heard in video number one, the Working Group does render decisions and so complaints submitted to the Working Group may render the complaint inadmissible before a treaty body. This will need to be assessed on a case-by-case -case basis.
The main challenge, however, to the admissibility of a complaint is the requirement to exhaust all available domestic remedies. As part of the admissibility test, treaty bodies will examine if the state against which the complaint has been filed had an opportunity to examine and decide upon the alleged violations. So before you submit a complaint to a treaty body, you must have exhausted all available domestic procedures in regard to the violations complained of. This is because the application and implementation of the treaties fall primarily to the state parties and treaty bodies should only intervene where states have failed in their obligations. So they will consider a complaint only where they believe that a victim's complaint has not been sufficiently remedied by the state. Where you can show that you exhausted all available remedies or that no such remedies existed, the burden of proof then shifts to the state party, which needs to provide reasons that domestic remedies were available to the complainant and were not exhausted. So how have the committees interpreted this requirement and what does this mean when we are preparing a case, for example, for the Human Rights Committee? While the committee will examine each case individually, the committee made clear that in cases involving serious violations such as extrajudicial killings, enforced disappearance or torture, only judicial remedies need to be exhausted. So that means that complaints, for example, to a National Human Rights Commission or other avenues that are non-judicial and purely administrative and which do not result in a binding decision usually do not need to be exhausted. In addition, only remedies that are suitable in light of the violation need to be exhausted. So in cases of torture or enforced disappearance, for example, a purely civil procedure, potentially resulting in the payment of damages to the victim, would be insufficient, as these types of violations will require a criminal investigation. A purely civil remedy would not be effective. You also need to show that you sought a remedy in relation to alleged violations of the Covenant. The domestic authorities and courts need to have had an opportunity to address the substance of your complaint. If you take a case to the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, complaints to domestic authorities and courts must have included an allegation of discrimination for the Committee to consider that the case before it has also been raised with the domestic authorities and courts. This may also mean that you need to go to the highest judicial authority possible. Where your case was dismissed by a lower court and an appeal is possible, you must usually make use of this opportunity unless you can show that this would have been futile in your case. Where the domestic remedy takes a long time or, in the words of the protocol, is unduly prolonged, we do not need to wait for conclusion before filing a case with the treaty bodies. The assessment of what is unduly prolonged depends on the circumstances of the case. There are important exceptions to the rule of exhaustion. Only remedies that are effective, available and offer a reasonable prospect of success need to be exhausted. If we want to rely on this exception, then we need to substantiate that in our case no effective and available remedies existed and that therefore there was no reasonable prospect of success in using any remedy theoretically available. For example, we may submit evidence to show that a judicial system has not been effective and available in cases such as the one we submit to the committee. This could include submitting authoritative reports from inst international institutions like the United Nations or the African Union, as well as reports from non-governmental organizations on a country's failing justice system and the breakdown of the rule of law in a country. We may have evidence showing that lawyers are prevented to register a complaint or that prosecutors never respond to complaints filed. Findings from the committees themselves, for example in their concluding observations on the state parties' periodic reports, may also show relevant shortcomings in the justice system. It is not sufficient to generally state that there is a breakdown of the rule of law in the state party. We must show how that breakdown of the rule of law concretely affects our case. So we can, for example, adduce evidence that we sought to file a complaint but were prevented from doing so because the authorities would not register it 
or that they never responded to any complaint and failed to investigate, even though they knew that a violation allegedly had taken place, triggering their obligation to investigate. It is also common for all treaty bodies that it is not necessary to report a violation to the authorities, where doing so would mean a real risk of reprisals against the victim, their family, lawyer or others connected to the victim. In such cases, remedies are in fact unavailable. In a case of torture by law enforcement, we might be able to show that those responsible for the torture were also those in charge of investigating any potential complaint against them, thereby exposing the victim to a risk of reprisals. We might have information showing that in similar cases, victims suffered reprisals after they sought justice at the domestic level. Where the victim of a violation had to seek asylum abroad, relevant refugee documents can also help to show the real risks of persecution. The victim may have been threatened during an interrogation, for instance, not to take any judicial action, which could also be used as evidence in support of our argument that domestic remedies are unavailable as they cannot be accessed by our client without the real fear of reprisals. So it is important to note that these exceptions exist and to apply these exceptions to our case where we can. Complaints to the treaty bodies will also only be admissible where they are submitted without undue delay. This is particularly relevant where domestic remedies were available and have been exhausted. So it is important to file the communication as soon as possible after domestic remedies have been exhausted. In some cases, submission after a certain period may result in the case being considered an abuse of the right to petition and to therefore be declared inadmissible. This is because the committees consider that long delays will make it difficult for the state to respond to the allegations and for the committee to evaluate the facts properly. Time limits to submit a communication from the moment of exhaustion vary depending on the committee, ranging from only six months with the, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination to five years with the Human Rights Committee. So at the Human Rights Committee, if you file your complaint five years after domestic remedies have been exhausted, the committee may declare the case inadmissible unless specific reasons exist that would justify the delay. It is unlikely that the committee will declare a case inadmissible solely because of such a delay but you need to explain why it was not possible to file the complaint earlier. This might be due, for example, to the victim's need to resettle as a result of the violation and having to deal with other, more urgent needs, or because of the impacts of the violation on the victim's health or because of the victim's other personal circumstances. This brings us to the end of this lecture on admissibility. It is a crucial part of any litigation before the treaty bodies, in addition to the fact section, getting admissibility right, that is, convincing the committee that a case is admissible, will already be a big step towards a positive finding from the committee, as it often suggests that the state party failed in remedying the alleged violation. See you for the next video, where we will look at protection and interim measures.